So uh, I'm really glad that you're here. And, you know, I was thinking about something this week. I'm like, I don't even really know what all a mom does. But I know one thing that we can do for sure is we can just have you stand and we can give honor for you for all the things that you do. So if I could have all the moms stand up so we can embarrass you just for a minute. And, uh, and we want to clap for you and cheer for you. And we just want to say thanks, all the moms. There you go. In, there, Look at that. Thank you. Woohoo! And I want you to know something. I, I, I don't know if you get thanked very much for doing the things that you do. I know there are things that, that people see and there's things that people don't see. And you're in all of that. And I just want to say thank you. And although we may not see it, the people around you, I want you to know that God sees it. And that God values it. And God values you and what you do. Now, because I am a guy and because sometimes I'm not the most aware that I should be, um, what I did was I did a little research on the Internet to find what it was that mothers do. So I just didn't know. And uh, so I was like, I see a lot of activity, but I like to pinpoint things. So I've got a few things here. And although if you're making a list, I'm sure that I've missed a bunch of things that you do. But here are a few things on my list. Um, and actually, I went to a mother's website for this. So, hey, some credence to that, just so you know um, where this is coming from. So you pack lunches, you work from your home or office, you buy groceries, you attend to kids, you attend your kids' events, you make dinner, you clean, you serve your church or community, you educate your kids, you, are the, you nurse your kids back to health, oftentimes after dad let them do something that you already told them that the kids shouldn't do, but now you're, you're the nurse and you step in, you're the chauffeur, as, or now as we call it, actually you're the Uber. So thanks mom for being the Uber uh, for your kids and for everybody else. You're the life coach, you're the meal planner, you're the birthday party planner. I didn't even think about this. Like if it wasn't for moms, the world would be really boring around birthdays, would it not? Like they're the ones who are responsible, getting all the streamers, balloons, cake, cake, anyone say cake, all of that stuff. Moms, you're the entertainer. And this, I was like, entertainer, I'm like, ah, it dawned on me. The reason why they're the entertainer is, have you ever tried to soothe a child that was screaming for really no reason whatsoever? And yet, all of a sudden, you go into entertainer mode, you do whatever it takes to try and soothe that child, you go into entertainer mode. You are the uh, butt wiper, enough said there, um, that one's covered, that was just on the list. You're the travel agent, you are the fun committee, it is certainly true at our house, my wife is the chairman of the fun committee. I don't know what that makes me, but not a member of the fun committee. Um, and just so you know that there's actually no such thing as a laundry fairy. I know. This is a surprise some of you students and some of you men. Like, there's no such thing as a laundry fairy. That person is called mom. She's the one who does that. So all of your clothes are dirty and they're everywhere or they're all in one place. And then they get clean and folded and put on hangers. Mom does that. There's like no other person. It's mom. There's no such thing as a laundry fairy. The mom is the lifeguard. She's the person who says, hey, put on sunscreen. The, sun's, it, the sun is, is really strong today. And put on more sunscreen and reapply. And also, you're also the ones giving nursing care after we don't listen to you when you say to apply more sunscreen. I'm going backward here. But you get the point. And here's the thing about moms. If you were to go to a mom and, I, and you were to give me the list of all the things that you do, what you would say is, you, and I would, if I were to ask you, why is it that you do that? And you would say, because I am mom. So, so the activity of, uh, of your life as a mother, you would say, the reason why I do it is because you're a mom. So what you do is based on a prior relationship. What we're going to see today is ultimately in, in the storyline of Ruth, and this is mentioned a few times in Ruth, but we're going to see that there's this special thing that happens when God's people are in relationship with Him. And it's this word, has said. It's really hard to define, so I just uh, kind of put a couple things up here. And, and honestly, in the Old Testament, it's mentioned many, many times. But has said is a loyal kind of love. It's just loyal. It's like faithful. It's just there. It's... It's also kind. It's goodness. And often used, often it's used of God's love in relating to the faithfulness to his covenant. So I, I couldn't help but think of moms and say, well, why is it that you do what you do? And you do all these things. And you say, 
because I'm a mom. And you say, because I have a relationship, because it's the basis of that relationship that you do all these things. And now there's this deeply valuable uh, concept in the Old Testament and New Testament, but it's just highlighted in the Old Testament, this has said of how God is loyal to people who are in covenant with him. God is loyal to people who are in relationship with him. But then he asks us as people of God to be those type of people for others, to offer this, has said, this loyal kind of love. In Ruth, this is one of the, the most uh, deeply uh, influential and impactful concepts that's discussed. You're going to see as we open up to Ruth 1, we're going to see that we see an element of Hesed in Ruth 1, verse 8. It's also, uh, you see an element in Ruth 2, verse 20. We're not going to get to this, but I'm just letting you know it's throughout. And then in Ruth 3, verse 10, there's another element of Hesed. This idea of because I'm in relationship with God, it means that I have to do something for other people. Like because I have relationship with God that I do something for other people. The tagline, the, the, the big idea for all of this, this whole series is outlook determines outcome. Outlook determines outcome. And then we're going to see this again highlighted in the storyline of Naomi and then in Ruth. To give you some idea of where we're going to be uh, in Ruth 1, if you flip there in, in a good old-fashioned Bible with pages just like mine, uh, if you have a device, you miss this, but where Ruth is uh, actually tells you a lot about its context because it's in the time of the judges. And maybe for you, you started at the beginning of your Bible and then you started flipping to the right and you flipped right over judges. And that actually lets you know the context of where this is. So this happens in the time of the judges before the kings. So when King Saul was the first king of Israel, King Saul ended the era of the judges but now we see that all of this takes part in the time period of the judges. And we're going to see some other uh, parts of the context here in just a moment. Uh, what we're going to do is read uh, starting in verse 1 through verse 13. And then at the end of my talk, we're going to kind of fly by the rest of it. We're going to take most of uh, our, our application from the first part. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land and a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and his two sons. They went to live for a while in the country of Moab. This becomes important in just a moment in the country of Moab. If you're somebody who underlines, you may want to underline Bethlehem and the Moab because it gives you the context of where all of this whole great storyline is playing out. Uh, verse 2, the man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Milan and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was there with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other one Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Milan and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. Times were very difficult. They are now, uh, Naomi and her two daughters-in-law are stranded in this foreign land, it should have been foreign to the people of God at the time. They're in the area of Moab, which was a forbidden area. So now they're stranded, and Moab is about 50 miles away from Bethlehem. So now they're 50 miles, but it's not like we think of 50 miles, like you just go on the other side of Macon, get in your car, and you can be there in less than an hour if traffic allows you to. But for them, 50 miles was, was a big deal. And actually, the, in between Moab and Bethlehem, was, um, was the, the Dead Sea. So there was this whole area in between them that, that then was, that would make this travel very difficult. So Moab was no man's land. You don't go to Moab. And yet the reason why they're in Moab is because there, this famine in the land that we just read, and because this famine that was in the land, uh, Elimelech was in Bethlehem, and he has this great idea. He says, how about we just leave the place of blessing? And Bethlehem means place of bread. There's all sorts of irony there. He says, why don't we leave the place of blessing, which is this is where God's people are supposed to be. And no, now we're not going to rely upon God and trust God like we ought to. Instead, we're going to go to Moab. So now his idea backfires, and now he's in Moab. He dies, and his two sons die. 
So now you have three women in a culture, and I'm so saddened by this, but it's so true. There's all sorts of things specific in the Old Testament I don't agree with, but it happened. And in this culture, women couldn't own property. Instead, they were more treated like property. So now Naomi has land, but she can't actually own it. So she's in a helpless situation, and she can't even care for herself. All because Elimelech decided that he knew better than God to leave the place of blessing, to go into the forbidden place of Moab. Verse 6. When she, heard, uh, when she heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of His people by providing food for them, Naomi and her daughters-in-law prepared to return from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living, and they, sent out on the, they sat out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to the dead, to your dead and to me. This becomes a, 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 something we're really going to draw out in a moment. Again, if you're somebody who underlines or highlights in your Bible, this part really becomes a, a main point in the whole storyline of, of, of Ruth, where it says, my, And may the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to your dead and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them and wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who would become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. Even if I thought that there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and they gave birth to sons, would you wait until... They grow up, she says, like it just doesn't make sense. Like you're going to wait until until they grow up and can do this. Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. We're actually going to see in this that Naomi's attitude is very poor. And the reason why it's poor is because of the poor leadership that happened in her home beforehand. Because when Elimelech had this idea that, hey, we're just going to leave the place of blessing, we're going to leave Bethlehem, and we're going to go to Moab, he wasn't thinking what might happen while we were in Moab. And instead, he dies, and his two sons die, and now his wife and the daughters-in-law are in a very desperate situation. She herself feels helpless. And you see that in her words. We're actually going to see that in how this passage finishes out. But I can't stress to you enough the the problem that Moab produced for them. This land was a forbidden land. Again, approximately 50 miles uh, from Bethlehem to Moab is about 50 miles. And in between was the Dead Sea. This was a forbidden land. This was a land that was marked by sin and shame. This was a land that literally got its name because of some horrendous sins that happened uh, that, we, that you can read about in Genesis 19 with Lot and his daughters. And this land is named the Moabites because of one of the sons that happened because of this terrible, terrible thing that happened with Lot and his daughters. So now this, this forbidden land has become a sort of Area 51. If you're familiar with Area 51, Area 51 it was made famous, I believe, in the 80s when the documentary started to come out and... and Truth started to be told about this forbidden place out in the desert, a place where they were doing where they had done all sorts of nuclear testing, a place where they had these secret airplanes. And that's actually what drew me in me being in the aviation industry. I I just loved airplanes and my favorite airplane flew out of Area 51. It was the SR-71 Blackbird. Google it, but not now. Do it later. It was just so I really got drawn into into this idea of Area 51, but you can't just drive into Area 51. You can't just fly into Area 51. As a matter of fact, they have perimeter set up to where you have to stay a certain amount of miles even from the perimeter. And there's so many security measures to keep people out. The people of God were supposed to stay out of Moab. Bethlehem was the place that Elimelech and Naomi should have been. They should have been in this area, and now they're in a desperate situation, all because of Elimelech's impatience. 
And what we also see here is the fulfillment of Proverbs 16, 9. It says that we make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. That Elimelech, he had made these plans. He's like, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go to Moab. There's no food here. There's a famine here. I'm just, God's just not providing here. I'll just go there and see what we can, see what we can kind of drum up in this area. That he made his plans, but the Lord determined their steps. And the steps that he wasn't accounting for was his own death. And the death of, of Ruth and Orpah's husbands. So now they're in this desperate situation. And yet, what, what I, I want us to, to sense and to believe in, in our mind and our heart is this. This deeply um, theological concept that we have to understand when it comes to getting kicked in the faith. And the reason why I wanted to bring this message into Mother's Day and all that's going on is because of this word called providence. Providence is a word that we use to describe God's beneficial rule over all the events of life. Which means everything that you have endured, everything that you will endure, every ache, every pain, every sorrow, every trial, every death, everything that we endure has been sifted through the hands of God. Because God is a God of providence and care. And how God is, this describes how God works and moves in those who have given their lives to Him. And it's to describe God's beneficial rule over all of the events of our life over all the events of our life, that God is not a God of chaos. We, we, we can think that God is a God of chaos because of what's happening in the world today, but He's not a God of chaos. He's a God of order. He's a God of, of, of resurrection. He's a God of restoration. He's a God of redemption. As a matter of fact, if you were to read the rest of Ruth in Ruth 2, 3, and 4, we see that, that God's ultimate plan of redemption is played out. That that Ruth would eventually marry a man by the name of Boaz who would become the, really the hero in, in this very short story of Ruth. And he would be such the hero that, that Boaz and Ruth actually would have a child. And, their, and out of their lineage and their descendants that, that eventually would come David. And eventually would come Jesus. And if you look in Matthew 1, there's only a few different women who are named in the genealogy of Jesus but Ruth is one of them. That although that they were in this situation that they shouldn't have been in, God was still, uh, still working, and, and they were still under His beneficial rule in all of the events of their lives that God was working out and working out and working out. I want to encourage you. You may be in a season right now where you're struggling with, maybe it's a struggle with doubt. Maybe you're in a struggle with a, just a sin struggle. Maybe you're in a struggle with, with a, a disease. Maybe you're struggling with just an ache of the heart. And I want you to know that keep trusting God. God will bring you through those things. This idea of has said is so, so rich and so deep and so, so wide and so all-encompassing. And yet in it is, there's this foundational belief in providence that God is still working in the world today. God did not create and then say, see you later, talk to me when you get all these things put together. And praise God He didn't. That God is still working today, still working in my life, and He can be working in your life. So, so providence is, is a key thing to see throughout this series and certainly in, in the life of Ruth and Naomi. But I want us to see also, and I drew this from verse 4, that she was a Moabite woman. Now she was a foreigner to the area of Bethlehem. She would have been an outcast. Again, tense filled. So, so what do you do? She either honors Naomi and she says, I'm going to stay with Naomi or I'm going to go back. I'm just going to stay at home because she herself was a Moabite. So do I either stay home and then leave Naomi or do I honor Naomi and then go back where I'm an outcast? So she's in a difficult situation. I know some of us maybe feel like we're in a difficult situation right now too. And yet she's, she's in a, a difficult spot and now we see the, the providence of God, of God just 
just working for the beneficial rule of her life and ultimately into the life of Jesus. I couldn't help but think of 1 Corinthians one twenty seven when I was studying this out. And, and it says this, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And I'm of the foolish. I'm of those who simply didn't know. And then God enlightened me. I was, I was one of the foolish who lived in darkness. And then God brought me to the light. For every person who's committed their life to Jesus and asked for salvation, the redemption of their sins, every person has gone from darkness into light. And, and all a part of that process from darkness into light. And now that we're living in the light, we're under God's beneficial rule for our lives. That everything that we do can be used of God to help shape us, to make us more like Him. But she was a foreigner. Ruth illuminates the, the loving character of God and demonstrates also how anyone who's been touched by the loving hand of God can display that love to others. So in Ruth, the, the book of Ruth, it just illuminates the loving character of God to see how under God's providential care, He's caring for this, this, these two women who now are going back in a desperate time, and yet God knows exactly what's going to happen. And although Elimelech, he, he made his plans, but the Lord determined the steps. And through, the, and through God's providential care, God is taking them step by step into where he wants them to be. And you may be in a situation where you're reaping the whirlwind of your sins, but I want you to know, if you turn back and you trust God, he can take you from that place into the place where he wants you to be. And not only does he just take you there, and it isn't like some beam me up Scotty thing. It takes time, and it takes surrender. It takes repentance. But when you get to where God wants you to be, you're a better person than what you were before. So in Ruth, we see this illuminating of the loving character of God. And Ruth then demonstrates how anyone who's been touched by the loving hand of God can display that love to others. We don't know when in this, this storyline of Ruth that she actually gave her life to God. We really don't know. But what we do see is something very significant in verse 8. Let's go there together. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show said. May the Lord show kindness to you. He says, May the Lord show said." To you, as you have shown to your dead and to me. So now she's saying this blessing. She's saying, May the Lord show to you, has said. Just may God show you this, as you have shown, has said to me and also to your husbands. So it's just this incredible thing that we see here. And this idea of has said this loyal kind of love, this loyal kind of kindness, loyal kind of goodness is so hard to define because even in that, the, the root word has said, it, it has several different nuances that can take you into different areas to say goodness or mercy or kindness or just a loyal love. But in all of them, it is a connection of this love of being in relationship, in covenant with God. And now, being in covenant with God's people. So has said is why God is continually at work in the world today. Because of God's has said, He created the universe and He rules it daily through His providence. Daily, He rules it with His providence, which means that the, who we have as a president now and who we have at, as, a, as a president before God knew, God knows, nothing is catching God off guard. The, the days, or the day rather, that you gave your life to Jesus, He wasn't surprised. He didn't say, well, I would have never thought she would have. He knew. He drew you, forgave you, saved you. It may have caught you off guard, but it didn't catch Him off guard. We also see that the Lord gives a, he gives a self-description of his said. If you could go to the left in your Bible, I want to read just a couple verses in Exodus 34. So this is the Lord describing his said, and we're going to see when he's describing it. It's, it's after Moses has already 
broken the first set of the Ten Commandments, and now the second one is, is been constructed, and now we're going to see how Hesed plays into this idea of covenant with God, covenanting with God. This is what it says in Exodus 34, verse 4 through 7. So Moses chiseled out two stone commandments like the first ones, and he went up to Mount Sinai early in the morning as the Lord had commanded him. And he carried the two stone tablets in his hands. Then the Lord came down in a cloud, and he stood there with him, proclaiming his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming. So this is the Lord proclaiming this. He says, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Maintaining love to thousands. Maintaining has said to thousands. And forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Here's a transitional word. It's the next word, and it says yet. So the first part is the part we want to hear. Like, yes, we want to know that God is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Ooh, that just gives me all the feels. I want that. But yet the next word, it says Yet, yet, he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of their fathers to the third and fourth generation. Which is why it's so important that we be people who dig into the elements of spiritual formation. This is why. Because although we can reap all the benefits of abounding in love and faithfulness and how God is slow to anger, the word yet ties in this simple truth that we also could be living bound to the generational sins of our fathers and our grandfathers. And it's only through the work of the Holy Spirit can our flesh be defeated. Flesh never defeats flesh. Only spirit defeats flesh. We need the Spirit of God to defeat the flesh to break those chains that have been caused by the generational sins. We do that by being in, in tune with the Holy Spirit of God through the spiritual disciplines. If you are a new believer, this is so important. Or if you've been a believer for a, for a long time, this is so important for you to be a person about prayer and the Word of God. These are the two primary means of which God speaks. You will never know what God is saying unless you do two things specifically. Get into the Word of God and pray and ask God. Outside of those two things, you're going to be, you're going to be like a ping pong ball going back and forth, wondering what it is that you're supposed to do in life. It's back and forth and back and forth. So there's certainly some things that we have to do. And when it comes to the generational sins, our responsibility is to get in tune with the Spirit so the Spirit of God can show us to bring to light all those things that need to be healed. It's the Spirit of God that reveals that wound, those wounds, and it's also the Spirit of God that heals those wounds. I couldn't stress that anymore. In Deuteronomy 7, 9 through 11, we see an element of Hesed as well. And it says this, Know therefore that the Lord your God is good. He is the faithful God, keeping His covenant of love to a thousand generations, those who love Him and keep His commands. Notice what it said. Notice what it said. Know therefore that the Lord your God is good, or that He is God. That He is the faithful God, keeping His covenant to the love of a thousand generations, of those who love Him and keep His commands. Of those who love Him and keep His commands. You could say, well, I love God, but if you're not in tune with Him, if you're, not, if you're not trying to live out the commands of Jesus, if you're not trying to love God and love other people, which is the fulfillment of the Old Testament law, if you're not doing those things, and if, if, if you're not growing in those things, you also are not going to be free from those generational sins. You're simply not. And all you have to rely upon is your flesh. And your flesh is not strong enough to break the flesh. We need the Spirit to a thousand generations of those who love Him and keep His commands. Notice that here's another transition word. But those who hate Him, He will repay to their face by destruction. He will not, show, he will not be slow to repay to their face those who hate Him. Therefore, take care to follow the commands, decrees, and the laws I give you today. 
He says, so he, there's this wonderful benefit of said of this loyal love and kindness and good and faithfulness of God. He says, but there's also consequences when you do the things that you ought not to do. There's consequences when you don't pursue God and when you pursue worldliness. There are consequences when you go out and, and you date that person you shouldn't date and you know you're not supposed to date and you pursue that person anyway and you tell God you know better and you're operating on your emotion and not the truth of God's word. That is a whirlwind waiting to happen for you. There's a consequence to, to you as, as moms and dads or grandparents and grandparents not surrendering to Jesus, asking the Holy Spirit to, to show you what it is that's broken in you there's also sins that are then passed down generationally when we don't own our failures before our kids. Then the same wounding that we have that we passed on to them, then pride is then formed around that wound, making it harder and harder and harder for them to have victory. All because we didn't lead well as parents. But has said is for the people who are in covenant with God. Make no mistake, it's for the people who are in covenant with God. This idea of, of hu in human relationships, of those who have, have come into the, the family of God, is what the New Testament calls it, or the, the body of Christ. Now we're in a covenantal relationship with God. And out of that covenantal relationship with God, that means that we also need to have said other people. That hints at loving your neighbor. Loving your neighbor, loving the other people who are also in covenant with God. Loving one another, as Jesus told us to. That's the, the expression of said through our lives. And we see a very clear uh, command for us, really. This is just a matter of obedience. said is rooted in obedience. In Micah 6, 8. And it asks the question, and then it gives the answer to the question. It says, He has showed you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? So many times people ask, you know, they may say, well, I just don't know what God's will for my life is. I just don't know what my identity is. I just don't know what my purpose is. We can start right here. You know what it is? To act justly. To act justly. And to love mercy. The word love mercy, those two words together is the word has said. It is to love mercy and to walk humbly before our God. So you say, well, Pastor, I just don't know what it is that I'm supposed to do. Here, how about we start with this? We act justly. We do the right thing, even if it's uncomfortable. We do the right thing, even if, if there's going to be other people around us who disagree with us. But because of the, the justice of God, we're going to act justly before God. And then we're not just going to have justice. Because if we just have justice without mercy, the justice, then we're going to turn out to be hypocrites and Pharisees. But instead, we, we have this idea of acting justly, but now we're also loving mercy. We're just loyally loving people. We're just doing things for the benefit of others without really expecting anything in return. And we're walking humbly with our God. When we walk humbly with God, then we can hear from God. Then God's word comes to life. When we're walking humbly with God, we can be taught. We can learn. The Spirit examines us, shows us, enlightens us, it renews the mind, it quickens the heart, it changes us. Has said, I'll summarize it by saying this Has said is the quality that moves someone to act for the benefit of someone else without considering what's in it for me. Has said is the quality that moves someone to act for the benefit of someone else. That's the reason why that there was hints of this when it comes to motherhood. Because this, I believe, is what, what a good mother does. They just care for one another instead of saying, well, what's in it for me? They're just looking to see how they can add value to their kids or maybe their kids' kids. Or if you're fortunate enough, your kids' kids. Kids. It's a lot of kids. But has said is the quality that moves someone to act for the benefit of someone else simply because they're in a covenantal relationship with God. Simply because of that. 
And yet the fullness of the Lord's has said is seen in the cross. It's seen as, as Jesus spread out for, for the world to see and for some to receive. That Jesus, the, just the, the expression of loyal love, that Jesus was loyal to the Father. He submitted to the Father. The Father was loyal to the Son. The Spirit also was loyal to the Son and Father. All three of them loyal to one another and connected to one another. And then when Jesus goes to the cross, you see that, that Jesus took the justice that we deserved. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says that God, meaning the Father, God the Father made Him the Son who had no sin to be sin for us so that in Him we could become the righteousness of God. That God made Him, Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us, to take sin for us. Because God was working out a plan the whole time. It was the plan of redemption throughout all of the Old Testament into the New Testament. It's a plan of redemption. And at the right time, even when we were powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. And dying for the ungodly so that we could become the righteousness of God because the, the hesed of God was on full display. And, and even more so, agape love, which is the Christian love, the self-sacrificing love, is actually even a higher degree of love, of hesed. And you see all of that culminating at the cross. I want to get back to the, the passage for just a moment before we wrap up. And, and with Naomi, Naomi's feeling what's, what's happened to her. You see the anguish at the last part of this passage. You see that, uh, that she, and at this they wept again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, and Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people, and her gods go back with her. So, and then... And then she says, just go back with her. You'll be better taken care of. And one thing that I think is valuable <clears throat> when it comes to the, the life of Naomi, specifically right here in this passage, is she is not ignoring reality. She's not ignoring reality. If we're to have a life of faith, it's not to ignore reality. Instead, it's to embrace reality with God. The most important part about what I said was with God. Because that's the providence of God. We're embracing reality with God. If we are going to be kicked in the faith, if our faith is going to be tried and it's going to be challenged, if we're going to endure setbacks in our life, we do so with God. So she is, she is, is certainly embracing her reality, maybe, maybe even a little bit more than what she ought to. So I'm going to give you a couple things to think about here and to process and hope that the Spirit will, will allow you to see more after even my words are done. But the uh, first thing I want to say is this. Don't let hope blind you. She could have been thinking, everything's going to be great. We're going back to my hometown. I, I've got my people there. I didn't really, you know, people in Moab weren't my people. I'm going back to Bethlehem. These are my people. Instead, she, is, she didn't let the hope of that blind her to the reality of the struggle that she may be walking into. I believe that many times even Christians can, they can live uh, with this idea of, of well, just I have hope, I have the hope of Jesus, everything's going to be okay, everything's going to be awesome, and yet we can kind of like try to separate ourselves from our current experience, and God wants us to, to learn from our current experience. So don't let hope blind you. God wants us to learn from our current experience. Nothing that you endure is, is wasted. Nothing. That God is moving in our hearts and refining us and challenging us and trying us so ultimately we become more like Jesus himself. Understand, too, that you might take a step that you regret. If you're going to step out in faith, you might take a step that you regret. And here's the thing. If you're under God's providential care and you get to, the, to a fork in the road and you're like, I just don't know what to do. And, and you just can't get the clarity of what is God leading me to do. It, by, the best you can do by using biblical principles, when you do that, you just trust in God's providential care. That ultimately, if you, if you just miss it and you take the wrong way, that out of God's providential care, that you've, determined, you've made your plans, but God's going to give you the steps to get you right where he wants you to be. It's trusting God. So don't give up. When it comes to that and thinking that, well, I just, you know, I might make the wrong step. 
It might be a step that, that I regret, and it might be. But yet, under God's providential care, he'll still bring you to where he wants you to be. And understand this, that we walk by sight. Oh, wait a minute. That's not what the passage says. What does it say in 2 Corinthians 5? We walk by faith and not by sight. So there's always going to be an element of trusting God even when you may not see the direct results. Let's finish up our main passage and then I want to give you four takeaways and then we're through. Verse 14 through 22. At this they wept again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May, may the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. <laughs> she just got wore out, basically. Verse 19 So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. And the barley harvest beginning would actually be the very thing that would connect into chapters 2, 3, and 4. And you see how this becomes part of God's providential care for these women as they go out and they try and live the rest of their lives. So let me give you four takeaways and then we're through. The first takeaway, if we're all under God's providential care, The first one should be without saying, really, but I need to because somebody needs to hear it. Don't give up on God. Don't give up on God. God is not through with you. Don't be through with God. Don't give up on God. You may be in a place that you don't know what to do, but trust God through it. You may be in your own area 51, your own Moab, like this, your own world where you're like, I just, I, I, I just don't know what to do. And it seems like if I make this decision, it's difficult. If I make this one, it's difficult. Trust God through it. Trust in God's providential care. Second one is this. Don't give up on you. Don't give up on yourself. If you are a person of God, you have the Holy Spirit residing within you. So not only does the Holy Spirit empower a believer to, to know the steps to take, but also the power to overcome the obstacles. And it's not the, the power to overcome obstacles where you kind of trip and fall over them, but to soar over them. So don't give up on yourself. Don't say, well, my faith is of nothing right now. Trust God and trust who God is making you to be. The third takeaway is this. Your influence grows when love shows. Obviously, obviously, Ruth felt love at some point from Naomi because now she's just bound to her. And she says, where you go, I will go. And the reason why her influence is growing is because she is in the genealogy of Jesus. And outside of of her doing these things and God's providential care, we may never even know the name, Ruth. And then for moms specifically, but also dads, the last takeaway is this. Your greatest contribution to the world may not be what you do, but whom you raise. It may not be anything that you do. You may think, well, I have a really simple life. I just keep the home or I work and I just provide for my kids and I don't even know if I'm winning or losing sometimes. I just want you to know it's not a matter of you um, maybe you feeling like you're winning, it could be simply over time you doing what it is that you're supposed to do as a mom that produces this incredible result that shows up in your kids. 
And I want to summarize and finish up this talk and, and explain to you a little bit about the video we saw earlier. That video is of a video series on YouTube. It's gone viral, and he calls himself the kid president. His name is Robbie Novak. And he, is, he and his family actually live in Tennessee, and uh, he and his sister both have brittle bones disease. And they live with adopted parents. And his life has is, is really been tragic, but he doesn't view it as tragic, even with all of that. And I have some statistics from a couple of years ago, but back then, a couple of years ago, he had had, he's not really a kid anymore. Um, in size, he is, but, but in age, he's not. But he's had over 100 surgeries up until a couple, hundred, uh, excuse me, up until a couple of years ago. He had had over 100 surgeries, and he'd broken over 70 bones. And yet, he was asked <clears throat> this question about his illness and, and all the struggles that he had faced. And he said this, and I think this is so profound. He said, well, we can cry about it, or we can dance about it. We were made to be awesome. That's what he said. He says, we can cry about it, or we can dance about it. And we were made to be awesome. When President Obama was in office, he had a sit-down with the, the kid president, and Robbie asked President Obama this question. He said, how can kids and grown-ups work together to change the world? And the president's response reminded me of his said. This is what President Obama said. He said, the most important thing that we can do is to treat each other with kindness and respect. And if the people of God would simply step up and have a loyal love even to other people, Christians, it would change our world. If we would just make a commitment today to have a loyal love and a loyal kindness and a loyal goodness and a loyal faithfulness to God's people, the rest of the world would look at us and they would say, there is something different about them. And Christians are, are here on earth not to be part of the world, but to change the world through Jesus. And I think his said may be part of the answer if we simply do what it is that we're being called to do. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you and we just are so thankful that your word is clear. So thankful that way before any of us were born, the, the reality of his said existed. This loyal kind of love and kindness and goodness. And it's just it's related to the faithfulness to, to the covenant. And God, for those who have given their lives to you, and they've recognized their sinful state, that they had their own moment where, where they realized that, that they were a sinner and that they were in need of a Savior. And they asked for forgiveness. God, for those people, they're under covenant with you. We're bound to be obedient to said to one another. Lord, I thank you for all of the, the mothers who are here or who are listening today. I thank you for what they do. And Lord, please encourage them and remind them that nothing they do is unseen. Nothing. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen.